All right, let's get with it. Father, I ask you to bring revelation to us, God. The people in the church, the people that receive this, the radio, television, YouTube, uh, however. And Father, we ask that you reveal through the power of the Holy Spirit what you want us to understand in our particular relationship with you. And I bind the devil from stealing the seed that is planted in anyone. Uh, Noel already read this, but I'm going to go ahead and read it again. This is Luke 24, 1 through 10. On the first day of the week, early in the morning, the women came to the tomb, bringing spices they had prepared. They found the stone was rolled away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of our Lord Jesus. Suddenly, two men, known as angels in radiant clothing, stood beside them. As the women bowed their faces to the ground in terror, the two men asked them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen from the dead. Can I get a shout? Thank you. The angel said, remember how he told you while he was in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And on the third day, rise again. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus today. We should embrace the resurrection of his body after death, which signifies the fact that not only was Jesus's dead body that was torn apart, resurrect, not decay, and become a glorified body, which he walked through doors and he showed up in all kinds of places and he ascended. But what we sometimes we don't connect he was the first fruit of every promise of God. In other words, he had to manifest what was our inheritance, meaning that we have no fear of death because our bodies embalmed, uh, burned up in a fire, uh, drowned in the ocean, um, wherever it was. Because Jesus's real physical body resurrected, that we celebrate today that that is the first fruit that our physical body will be resurrected again into a glorified body. Let's give a shout on that because sometimes we don't, we don't realize this. So when we read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and Thessalonians and Ephesians, that's my go-to books. Uh, there's so much revelation in that. Then I will make comments and there will uh, be a little bit more detailed look at the extremely specific event in the resurrection of Christ believers. Yes, I'm not preaching today. I'm going to do a lot of reading with a little bit of teaching because I want to cover this. This is my only chance for some people to hear this. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, but we do not want you to be uninformed that's a night nice word, and he comes back, or ignorant. Now, remember, ignorant is not being stupid. Ignorant is you don't know, okay? So he says, we don't want you uninformed or ignorant, brethren, about those who are asleep. He didn't say dead, right? So those that are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the people who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him all those who have already fallen asleep in Jesus. Now, listen to Mike. My job is to read and study the Bible. You got that. Okay, in that, I find out that there's so much revelation in Thessalonians. The Thessalonian church was the only church out of all the new churches that had it right. You understand that? They, they, they had a unique thing. They actually loved one another. And besides that, they loved other people that even were, I mean, man, I'd love to pastor a church like that, okay? Because I got people that don't love me that are in my church, okay? So uh, imagine they loved one another and we're all, you know, sometimes it's a real struggle to love one another. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, just, just, just think about that a while. But they not only loved the, the people in the church, they loved the people that wasn't in the church. So I want you to know they were unique. Would you say with me, the Thessalonians were unique. They truly loved other people. 
All right. So for this, we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have already fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and... Now, wait a minute. I didn't get to the trumpet yet. So for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. I don't blame Ezra. This is such a good message. He's anxious. Okay. So in the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ will rise when? First. Then we who are still alive will remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the, always be with the Lord. We're always going to be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage and comfort one another with these words. Why? They were under tremendous persecution. And some of the, the people in the church in Thessalonica were already being killed for their faith. And because the people of that church loved, they loved one another. And when one of them was persecuted and was killed, uh, uh, they, they took it really hard. Okay. So in the early church, the details of what happens to Christians after they died was were unknown. You know why? They didn't have Christian television, Christian radio. They didn't have a, a, a written epistles and a Bible, and they didn't have Bible studies and so on. They just had faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they wondered, I love my people, but he was killed. What happens to him now? Yeah, Jesus is coming back for me any day, because remember, the church had... Uh, in Thessalonia, that, that church was sure that any day Jesus was coming back. Understand that? So when somebody was killed or somebody had a heart attack and died, they felt like these people are going to miss out. Do you follow that? Now, we don't like to miss out on anything. But generally, we're not that upset if somebody else misses out on something if we didn't miss it. But these people were unique. They showed the character of Christ in this entire church. They didn't want anybody, even somebody that they knew that had died or was killed in persecution, to miss out on the coming of the Lord. Do me a favor. Raise both hands and say, even Lord, now here I am. Let's go. Let's see. Come back. How many of you are ready for him to come back like right now? Okay. Now, when I studied this, I got to thinking, I have not only my children and their husbands and wives, but, uh, but I have my grandchildren, and now we have five, five great-grandchildren, and since my grandchildren are still young and in love, we're probably going to have more great-grandchildren coming. And, and in this world where, where you can't tell a man from a woman and you can't, you got, you can't say he and, and she and you got to watch what you're doing. And, and now the, government, the Supreme Court said women can still uh, go on the Internet and get the pill to kill the baby. Uh, it, 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 you know, this, this, this is really bad. And now that Elaine and I are in, you know, I'm... She's younger than me, but I'm, I'm approaching 77 now, so I can't even say mid. I said, yeah, I'm in the late 70s, and so, you know, I'm closer to the tomb than I am to the womb. And, it, it, and, and I, I worry about them in a fallen world. I won't be here to protect them. I won't be able to, you know, and, and so I dread it. Well, I'm trying to say that because the Thessalonians believed Jesus was coming like maybe tomorrow. And what's going to happen to all these people that we love, who love the Lord and died in persecution or died, and they felt bad about it because they really loved people, and they didn't want them to miss out on anything. It's nowhere else in the Bible is this represented. Now, let me read it again. In the early church, the details of what happens to Christians after they died was unknown, elusive, and the Thessalonian believers were concerned and worried about the subject where do Christians go after they die? 
what happens to their souls and what happens to their bodies. So these questions troubled young believers in the church at Thessalonica. And as we assume, because they did not have the full revelation as we do, they didn't have an epistle. They didn't have uh, th this revelation because they were still living in mystery at that time because it wasn't un unfolded. Because they did not have the full revelation as we do now in the New Testament, that concern was specific as the Apostle Paul had been teaching. And he ministered about the fact that Jesus was going to return to earth. But to them, he taught it like it could be any day. Now, let me tell you why. We ought to get up in the morning and, and decide it could happen every day. When you think he might come any moment, that guy that turns in front of you, maybe you won't, you won't shout something at him. Maybe you won't resent that your, your sister-in-law said something about you. Maybe you won't be tempted to sin because you don't want to be caught when he comes back. Now, I think somewhere in Hallucinations uh, 3.11, it says, when the cat's away, the rats really play. But when the cat's there, the rats, they, they watch themselves. Follow that? Why? Because we do better when authority is watching our lives. When you really believe any moment the Lord is coming back and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, when he's coming, when he's, when he, if, he's, if you knew he was coming back, it's like if you're lounging around watching the television and the phone rings and, and your, your in-laws saying they come, they, they, they're in the area and they're going to drop by. All of a sudden you run around and you straight to the kitchen and you pick up the, the pizza off the table and all that because, because, you know, well, how about if the Lord just shows up? Are you ready for him? Now, when you can't say amen, say, oh, me. But God wants the mystery because we don't know when he's coming back. Now, we know he's coming back, but the problem is we don't know. And it'd be really hard uh, to be at the Saints game as a Saints fan with a bud in your hand. It'd be really bad to get caught when getting caught up is about to happen. Now, I so believed in the rapture. When we lived on Murray Street and, 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 and old Algiers, and I was working in the backyard on something. I was still doing artwork outside. And I heard this incredible sound. I couldn't identify with it. So I ran in the house. Elaine, Frankie, Missy. And none of them were in our house. I remember I said, my God, I got left behind. <laughs> and what had happened, a car wreck had happened. And they ran out the house there and around to look at And I didn't know. And I come in. I couldn't find them, let me tell you. Fear from the top of my head to the soul of the because I really believe he came back and I missed it. And I try to live that way that every time I hear a sound, somebody blows the horn, I, I, I want to get a head start on everybody else because I believe in the rapture. The rapture's not taught anymore. Now, if we go back to chapter one, for example, the chapter ends with these words that some believers had turned to God from idols to serve a li the living and true God and to wait, say wait, and to wait on the Son of God to return. So the people that were idol worshipers that heard the gospel, they repented of it and they came and they were ready to go because they had an expectancy. But you see, they repented from the idols and they, they, they wanted to go. They believed Jesus was coming back. I wish the church lived in that expectancy. We wouldn't gossip. We wouldn't slander. We wouldn't hold grudges. We wouldn't be sloppy. We'd watch what we watch on television. We'd get a little bit more holy if we really thought we don't know the time and the hour when he's coming back like a thief in the night. 
You don't want to get caught criticizing other Christians when all of a sudden you hear the sound, everybody's gone in the twinkling of an eye. Scientists call the twinkling of an eye faster than you can blink. That the dead in Christ will be changed in a glorified body, come up out of the graves all over the world, out of the sea, out of everywhere. They're already up in the air. And then we, which are alive, will leave these bodies and instantly become a spirit to meet him in the air quicker than you can blink. You don't have time to say, I'm sorry. Let you know I didn't mean it. See, why would he want to come back like a thief in the night? Because he knows we're sloppy agape and greasy grace people. We take, we, we, you know, we, we, you know. But if you're ready, and here's the thing, he's coming back for who? Those who are looking for him. Which I believe if you're not looking for his return, he might come back and you didn't know. Why? Because you weren't ready. Why? Because you weren't believing he was coming back. I'd rather live thinking this might be the day. So all day long, I'm going to be, I'm going to watch my P's and Q's as much as possible because I don't know the time and the hour. That's a mystery. Say mystery. mystery. How belongs to God. We don't know how anything's going to happen because God needs mystery so that we do not invade him and think we can figure him out. In chapter 2, we also have reference to the return of Christ, verse 19, who is our hope or joy or crown or exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord at his coming? There are other references to Jesus coming in this epistle in chapter 5, 1. As to the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night, while they are saying peace and safety, that their destruction will come upon them suddenly like the labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. We're talking about like that everything changes. See, God in his infinite knowledge is not going to give people a chance to repent. The Bible says I will not, I will not put up with man I will not strive with man. You got plenty of time. You heard the message. It wasn't good enough for you. You had another idea, another thought. Brother Mike, you're scaring me. I hope so. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can't have any wisdom if you're not afraid of what God's judgment is going to happen on people when he killed his own son and that's not good enough for you? You need another gospel? But you, brethren, are not in darkness. We're in the light. That's why you're here today. The only reason you came here, and some of you only came here or in church somewhere else, because you, you have enough sense to think the Bible might be true. So I'm going to test it on Easter and Christmas. See, they expected the coming of Christ at any time. They also expected the judgment of God. In an event called the Day of the Lord, say with me, the Day of the Lord. Now, if you have read the Old Testament, the Day of the Lord is something, it's a special day because God's finally going to have enough. There's a thing called the wrath of God. Now, in the modern day church, we don't take it like they used to, but they really understood when God got angry, you were in trouble. And there's no solution for that. The best thing you can do is to fear God. The fear of God produces wisdom, which means you force yourself to believe the Bible's true. 
They expected the coming of Christ at any time. They also expected the judgment of God, an event called the Day of the Lord, a remarkably familiar Old Testament term. But they were living in expectation that this event could happen at any time. Paul taught nothing in any of his writings about this, either here or in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, that would lead them to believe it could not happen. Now, what they had... I wish we had in modern times because they lived and not knowing when they woke up the morning, if this would not be the day of the Lord. I'm telling you, we do better if we're being watched, if we're being supervised. We do better. If you are a businessman, you'll find out that if you don't have a manager, the people you pay to work for you won't work as well. They have to be watched. They have to be structured. They have to be controlled to a certain place. That's why I'm in a place where I have to give godly rebukes to some people because they're not controllable without that. So there is a serious expectation of an imminent event, the return of Christ. They also had the pressure that it could happen in their lifetime. That is the emphasis of the message we read. The question they were asking is this, if this event is going to happen and they believed it was going to happen, that the Lord is going to return to us, that we're going to be with him and we're going to be in his presence. But what happened to the people we love that died already or will die before he comes back? They didn't want to enjoy being in the presence of the Lord if the people that they loved. So they had, this is what they had on us. They believed he was really coming back at any time. We don't have that. They had the fear of the day that judgment was going to hit the fan. We don't have that. Uh, they, they loved people who, to the point that they didn't want to miss out anything. That is the question posed in the 13th verse. Then Paul answers, we do not want you uninformed. We don't want you ignorant, brethren, of those who have already died. But he uses the word asleep. Say with me, asleep. So that you will not grieve as the unbelievers who have no hope. I've had to deal with, uh, we've getting ready, we were in ministry at First Assembly one day, and I got up a little bit early, and I was getting ready to go to church. We were going to go to church because I would meet with all the, the, the uh, Bible study, uh, home Bible study people. That was my, our service. And we're getting ready, and I hear, boom! And being a hunter, I knew it was a gun. Went off. It was early in the morning, and wound up my Jewish neighbor, whom I would not hear my message, Next door, he had, he, had, I had about six kids, I think mostly girls, and he was right next door. And he sat on a, in, a, in a, a, a lawn chair on his back patio and put a gun to his head and blew his brains out. And he was laying there breathing and so on. I was in the ministry. I was over there, and I was trying to deal with him. And the police wanted me to work with the family, so I invited him over for Elaine and I. And the wife, they were Jewish, and the wife was sitting on our sofa in the front room, and this is, she called for the, the, the uh, rabbi, and the rabbi came, and she goes, Rabbi, where is my husband? And he looked at her, and he says, I don't know. I don't have an idea. And then I realized that, that they live with no hope. All of the Jews in America, they go to the synagogue and so on, it's more of a social thing. They don't believe in an afterlife. So when one of them dies, they, they don't know because they don't have a savior. I'm not mocking them, just telling them that they live with no hope. And I saw that, okay? And so you don't want, when you lose people, uh, like I've lost a son. My sister back there, she lost her son and her daughter recently. And, and you don't want to live where you have no idea where the people you live, what happens to them. There's a trauma in that. Uh, so 
we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that you were going to suffer afflictions and persecutions. And so now it's happened. We told you when you got saved, listen, the devil is going to come against you. Jesus told them, they're going to hate you, not because you're you, but because you identify with me. They hated me first, they're going to hate you. They're going to, they're going to do terrible things to you. None of it's going to be fair. And now it happens and you're surprised? But you thought I was kidding? So now, yes, people in your church who love God and they praise God and they gave up idols and, 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 and somebody comes along and kills them, stones them to death just because they're a Christian. And it can happen to you maybe tomorrow. Jesus says to us that are right now, he says, understand persecution is going to happen to you, not because of anything about you. It's because they hate me. Therefore, they hate you because you identify with me. He says, but when it happens, don't throw a rock at them. Don't curse them. Don't even try to avoid it. Do a little dance and say, you know, great is my reward. Where? Way off in heaven, though. And all of a sudden, heaven is where your reward is a long way. And you know, probably this is going to happen to you again and again and again. And Paul's telling them, listen, this ain't a surprise. This is how it is. What is going to happen to those people who suffered persecution even to death? They would be the noblest of the nobles. They assume the best. That, you know, when people die, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we make heroes out of them. And that's how they felt. Like these people, uh, they were persecuted and they were killed for Christ's sake. Therefore, when he comes back, they ought to be on the front row. And now they're going to miss it because they died in the faith or they had a heart attack. And then what would, about the people who died by natural causes? Would they miss the momentous event of Christ coming back? Was that death then a judgment on them? Was it sort of like communion, what we just had in 1 Corinthians 11.30, that some of them colored outside the line, some of them did something, and then they took communion with an impure heart, and they died? So did God judge them? Did he punish them? Would they then not take part in the great reunion and the great gathering in heaven where all of us are going to eventually be in the presence of God forever? Would they miss out? Now, understand, these people didn't have the revelation we have today. I'm going to go over it again. We're lacking in fear of the Lord's judgment. We're lacking in belief that he's coming back at any time. And we're lacking in love for other people. And we best basically live our Christian life like it's, there's an arc of safety, salvation. Mama and Papa and the kids, Acts 2, 4, and no more. Once we get our house, you know, we punch the clock, we got our people saved. The hell with everybody else. They don't have vision for the lost. And they don't have vision for the lost, knowing the wrath of God, who's those who reject the name of Jesus Christ. We feel like you want to reject Jesus. Well, you deserve whatever happens to you. The Thessalonian church had a burden that God had even for the lost. Would they somehow be just as living spirits but never have a body? Would they somehow be lesser saints because they did not take part in this magnificent event? This whole matter produced in them a certain amount of concern that is because the Thessalonian believers were marked by a particular important character virtue. They actually had deference for other people. It mattered to them what happened to other people. Chapter 4, 9 through 10 says, Now as the love of the brethren... You have no need for us to write to you, to straighten you out, for God taught you on his own to love one another. For indeed, you do practice love towards the brethren who are all in Macedonia. The best we can do to say, is, hey, keep on doing what you're doing. There were, they were marked by love for one another. In fact, this is the only church that Paul ever wrote to that he did not point out error, heresy, sin, and confront it. 
There is not anything like that in any of his letters to the Thessalonians. They were marked so by such a pro profound love for one another and even those outside their local fellowship all through Macedonia. This added to their group, their grief in their minds if someone died and would miss the second coming of Jesus Christ. Were they going to be disembodied spirit forever? Uh, are they going to miss having a glorified body? Were they going to be lesser saints? Were they going to miss the experience of being there with Jesus Christ at the second coming? So Paul writes to them on a more than theological event uh, level, on a very practical level to alleviate their frustration and grief about this because understand, say with me, up till now it had been a mystery. Jesus had never talked about the rapture. He talked about his second coming, but he didn't talk about it. Now, why was that? Well, remember, he says, only the Father knows that. Even Jesus was in mystery over it, which is hard to understand, but that is in the order of God. So Paul writes to them on a more theological level, on a practical level, to alleviate their frustration and their grief about this. He writes to them about those who are asleep. Say with me, asleep. Paul does not want them to be ignorant about those who have died. He calls them asleep. Say with me again, asleep. Now remember, if you read the Old Testament and you read the, 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 all of the men that were preceded Jesus in the line of David, they, every one of them, it didn't say they died. It said they slept. And then they slept with their fathers. And they didn't say one time that they died. So there's no reason, he writes to them, there is no reason of being full of grief, no need to be in hopelessness. Paul says in verse 13, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus all those who have fallen asleep since the beginning of the church. Yeah, come on, let's, let's give him a little gravy in here, okay? So, thank God Jesus rose from the dead. But Jesus rose from the dead to tell us we're going to rise from the dead. And that's not heresy. That's a, prop, that's a prophecy. We who do not, do you think when Jesus uh, walked through the door, he was just showing how special he was? That's a testimony of what a glorified body can do, that once it died, a terrible mortal death. We do not need to grieve as the rest of the world does, meaning those who have no hope. No hope of what, I wrote? No hope of seeing Christ, no hope of reunion with him. Uh, they were now to become hopeful as true believers in this bond of love. All would become reunited. So he, Paul takes a mystery that had never been revealed, and for the first time in biblical history, he reveals the truth of a mystery of what would happen to Christians who die. So remember, they did not have the full written revelation of the New Testament, so this is exceedingly early in the life of the new church. These questions at that time had not yet been answered. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul describes this event as a great mystery, that's the words he used, up to this point, which means it is something that had been hidden, eaten from the church world all this time. Now, Paul is revealing that there was not only a resurrection of the body of Jesus Christ, but the promise of a resurrection of every believer's body, whether they died previously or are still alive. Say with me, I'm waiting for the rapture. Our great hope is not just heaven. <laughs> it's being resurrected, even our body resurrected from ashes, dirt, whatever it is, supernaturally. Remember, the how belongs to God because the resurrection we suffer today is the example of the manifestation that we will inherit as the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, this body of Christ shall rise from the dead. 
Paul answers the distress and the confusion and ignorance with a clear description of a single event that will be next on God's prophetic calendar. I have an appointment this Wednesday, and I put it on my calendar. God has a calendar of prophetic events that are revealed along the way. Jesus Christ was not allowed by God to know for whatever reason because God wants a mystery. Those of us that had the mind of Christ, we might have gotten some revelation. So God withholds that so that the order of all of his, everything that he has, all of his purposes can be accomplished to the fullest to his glory. So the phrase we call rapture, because in verse 17, the phrase caught up is harbaso, which means, listen, it's a long thing. To seize and snatch up, further defined by a force of a sudden swoop, by an irresistible force that pulls you away. When I studied this years ago, scientists took the word in the twinkling of an eye, and they found out it's quicker than you can blink your eye that you're not even conscious of as your eye blinks. That dead people, rotten people, People in the ocean, people wherever, and less than that, are going to rise first with a glorified body, and then we coming right behind them, and we're going to meet the Lord in the air with the angels quicker than you can blink your eye. Come on, shout unto glory over that. That's what she's celebrating today. To sneeze and snatch up. Now look. Years ago, we had um, the place in the French Quarter, right off the French, off of Bourbon Street, where we had, uh, so that we, our witnessing teams, when I was at First Assembly, could witness the people. And, and let me tell you about 90% of the people we witnessed to uh, backslidden children of pastors and ministers and so on. It's an incredible thing. But anyway, we had that little room. Well, Jonas and I were out on the street one day, and I heard these bells. And you don't see this anymore. I don't know what happened to them, but about 50, 60 Hare Krishnas in white bed sheets came down with their little bells. And they're walking down the street. So we were just stretching our hands out, Jonas especially, you know, and they were dropping like flies. He was binding up devils and so on. But, but their heads were shaved, and then they had a little thing, and they had big ponytails, every one of them, and their heads were shaved. Well, I found out I was studying because they believed that Allah or Krishna was going to rapture them, and what he was going to do, he was going to reach down and grab them by that hair and pull them up to heaven. And I go... Damn. <laughs> That's why I'm glad I'm a Christian. <laughs> I don't need to have hair. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna hear, I'm gonna hear a shout from the archangels. I'm gonna hear the trumpet and in the twinkling of an eye, I'm out of here. And I'm gonna be with the Lord forever and ever. My great hope. My great hope. The term rapture is simply a word to describe the event, the Lord snatching us up by divine force. Critics go, rapture is not in the Bible. I said, yeah, but Horbaso is. And the description of Paul the apostle who gave the revelation is. And so the term rapture is simply a word to describe the event of the Lord snatching us up by his divine force. What verse 17 is saying is there will be a time when believers are snatched up suddenly by the divine, irresistible force of God himself, snatching us to himself. Come on, shout in there. Even now, Lord, come now. This is not the event when Christ comes back to earth. This is not when his feet touch the Mount of Olives. Some of y'all went with Mike and Elaine to... To, uh, to, we went there. We stood at the Mount of Olives. We stood at the graveyard where all of the Muslims are burying their thing because they knew an uh, Israelite cannot pass through. And Jesus says, well, when, I'm up, when I come back and I'm heading that way, I'm just going to raise all the dead and walk right on through them. Amen? 
The devil, the devil is a liar. God's got it all figured out. This is not the event when Christ comes back to earth. This is not when his feet touch Mount of Olives and he turns the desert into a garden. This is not when he returns and sets up his millennial reign. This is not Christ on earth because it clearly says, he says, I'm going to come close, but I'm having to meet the air because the timing of God's calendar, my feet can't touch the earth. Because if his feet touch the earth, there wouldn't be any tribulation. There would, there would be instant, he would cut off the judgment of God because he gave himself for all people. We know this is also, I thought you would like that, Mark. Uh, there is no judgment in this whatsoever. This event is strictly the snatching away of the body of Christ, the believers to meet him in the air. Then judgment can hit the fan. The promised rapture is the next event of Jesus Christ. There are scriptural foundations and pillars on which the truth of the rapture stands. The rapture's comfort about life after death does not rest on philosophical speculation. It does not rest on human opinions. It does not rest on evolution or science. It does not rest on the edict of any church council. It does not rest on religious intuition. It rests on the fact that God said it. The truth is the rapture rests on historical fact. The foundation or pillar of God's hope is historical truth. Paul breaks it in three parts. First, the rapture is based on the death of Christ. First Thessalonians 4.14, for if we believe that Jesus died, and we do. First, if we start believing that Jesus actually died, then we're going to come to the fact that he rose again. The Thessalonians believed that Jesus died, but they did not grasp the full significance of that. It is the conditional clause that is the condition that will be fulfilled. And the conditional clause is you have to believe he died and you have to believe he rose again. They, they couldn't grasp that. They did believe he was coming back, but they didn't understand about the rapture because it had been a mystery. So we could translate it as this, and this is the best I could come with. Since we believe that Jesus died, it is his death that fulfills all necessary conditions. And I wanted to call this message, the day death was turned into sleep. Say with me, the resurrection of Christ was the day death on earth was changed into sleep. And the Old Testament verifies that by all the elders asleeping. Sleep is the term used when referring to believers only because death for us was changed into sleep. Now, death can be as welcoming as peaceful sleep. Let me tell you. Everybody knows this. Elaine lights up at night. She's one of them night owls. By quarter to nine, she has to remind me my name is Mike. And, you know, I mean, I, if, we're, if we're somewhere, I start unbuttoning my clothes. She, Mike, don't get undressed at church. I said, yeah, but it's almost nine. You know, I mean, I, my body just it, just, it just wants to lay down. I welcome sleep. How about you? You ever welcome sleep? God wants us to welcome death like we're going to sleep. There's no fear in that. Give him a shout of victory in this house. And he says, now death can be as welcoming as peaceful sleep is welcome. We don't fear going to sleep. We hope we'll go to sleep. Death has lost its sting. Take that, devil. Death has lost its sting in grave. Where in the helicopter is your victory? There's no victory. There's no victory over us. And the reason death for believers is only sleep is because Jesus bore our sins in his own body and because he became sin for us. Jesus died our death. Raise your hand and say, Jesus died my death. If Jesus died my death, I don't have to die my death. 
He took on all the wrath of God. His perfect sacrifice paid the penalty for all our sins. By his death, we absolved from death. By his death, we were set free from our death. Scripture does not say slept, but that he died. If it had said Jesus, the only one in the whole lineage that did not sleep because he had to die. If he had slept, that we all would have to die. But because he didn't sleep, he died. He died our death. So now our death becomes sleep. Give him a shout in his house. My God. Oh, Lord Jesus. Let me read it again. By his death, we were set free from our death. Scripture does not say he slept, but that he died. So that death for us is now sleep. Christ entered all, all that engaged in death. He, he, he did death, hell, and the grave. He, he did it all. All that took part in judgment of the cross. And we who trust in him will never see death or judgment, but merely sleep. It is not with the new age people. There's, we don't soul sleep. Now listen to me. When my son died... His spirit went instantly in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, our last breath, we go right into the presence of God. All right? But his body, his body, we call, was dead. Is that right? Now, we learn now, he went to sleep. He was a Christian. He literally went there singing angels over me. Okay. Now, that's why we were able to have victory in his death, losing our only son. But we want to understand the reason why we celebrate Resurrection Sunday is it's proof that we as best, our own bodies will be resurrected in the glorified bodies but at the moment of death, to be absent from that body is to be present with Christ. But when he comes back in the air, our bodies will be changed into immortal glorified bodies as he had, with the same properties as he had, and our spirits will be reunited, reunited and we will meet him in the Lord. And all of the saints who were persecuted and ever died will come up out of the, with a glorified body and we will go to be in heaven and then terror is going to break out on the earth. The wrath of God is going to hit this place like an asteroid. Now death can be as welcoming as peaceful sleep is welcome. Death has lost its sting. Christ entered all that engaged in death, all that took part in judgment, and we who trust in him will never see death, but will merely sleep, and that is not just our souls, but only our bodies. Death was changed into sleep by the work of Christ. The whole concept of death was turned upside down, transformed for we who are believers. Christ made a new name for death. He called it sleep. I call it sleep. Hebrews 2.15, now since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus also shared in humanity being born into a natural body through Mary so that by his death he might destroy him. Jesus had to die to destroy death. He had to have victory over death, hell, and the grave. That's why he even descended into hell. Who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who who all their lives were held in bondage to the fear of death. Now listen to Mike. The world right now is paralyzed because our government, the governments of the world, are trying to control to keep us afraid of sickness and disease, asteroids, Martians, global warming. Don't take the bait. The earth belongs to God. Everything in the universe belongs to God. And they can say anything they want. I have people that have left this church for fear 
of catching COVID. I've been re I've rebuked by people who laugh because they said, when I preach, I have a tendency to go down here and I don't wear a mask. This is a place of hope and healing. Yeah. This is when you have a disease, this is where you come. This is a place of life. When a Christian begins to fear death so bad. Now, the contradiction is the f they, they're afraid to come here because they could catch a disease, but that disease is not at Walmart or Home Depot. I don't care what they do. I don't, you can be listening to this. I don't care. I, I don't care. If that's what you think, you need to be godly rebuked that your thinking is crazy. This is a place that we bring people to be healed supernaturally, to be, de to be delivered from depression and anxiety and perversion. This is a place where heaven touches the earth. This is a place of contact where the Holy Ghost gives revelation way better than your religion can ever do for you. Stand on your feet and shout. Jesus! Jesus! Because he lives, we're going to live. Now, my last scripture is this. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus not only died, but we believe that he arose. And because he lives, we will live with him forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you were encouraged and blessed by the word. And if you'd like to partner with us at White Dove, I want to share a couple of ways that you can give to this ministry. First, you can text the letters WDF to 45777, or you can go to our website at whitedove.org. Thanks again, and God bless.